Today's subject, we're continuing on what we were discussing the last two weeks, and um, I'm trying to get to a, a close on this issue, which doesn't end so quickly. We discussed last week, what are you allowed to put yourself in the danger for and how much danger? That's basically, that was the subject which we discussed. I would like to discuss, I'm going to start with, I think a very important question, which looms in the back of all of our minds. How much danger am I allowed to, am I supposed to put myself in to Davu Dominion? Okay, I, I don't know anybody we speak about that issue in particular nowadays, right? So that's a, that's a question which really we would like to address. And this is the question which I think that everybody is grappling with. And um, I'd like to start off with a question and a rush in Sochim. We eat charoises together with our moro. Why do we eat charoises together with our moro? Because otherwise the kids wouldn't have anything to ask. That's true too. But that's also only true too. The Gemara says the reason why is because in the moro there's some kind of a uh, negative thing that could be dangerous. And you dip it into the charoises, and that neutralizes that dangerous thing, and then you're allowed to eat it. So there's two questions. I'll first ask it the way the Bilyashev asks it, and then I'll ask it the way the Rosh asks it. The Bilyashev asks it, so why don't we do it? The Gemara says that a person doesn't have a vegetable for karpas, he could use mora. And it doesn't say anywhere is that if you use marar for karpas that you have to dip it in. It's only when you use the marar for marar that you have to dip it in. The Rush asked the question a little bit simpler. He says, people eat marar all year long and nobody's dipping it into charasis to neutralize this dangerous thing. So the answer to the question is really where we are right now. It's dangerous, but it's not so dangerous. So now I'm going to go back to something I mentioned the first year. Said over the story about this bris that I was able to be the moil at, that the mother didn't want to have another baby because she was afraid she was going to die in childbirth. And this Talmud uh, Chacham from America said, that um, Kodesh Baruch Hu doesn't demand the person put himself in Sakonis Nefoshis in order to be Mekai Mitzvah. So that's why ladies don't have the Mitzvah of Puravu. But he puts it into their mind that they willingly put themselves into that danger. That was the subject which we discussed then. And, uh, and so it was, so to speak. That's what actually happened. So... A person is allowed to, a lady would be allowed to have a baby. You know, it's a very important, uh, very important issue. A lady is allowed to have a baby. Now, a lady is allowed to have a baby. It has its uh, qualifications to it also. A lady is not allowed to have a baby if it's a kind of for her. But we just said having a baby is a kind of sefoshes. So what's the answer to the question? We know many ladies that have had babies that have lift. So a lady is allowed to have a baby. I will just make a statement over here. Since we're in the over 60s group, I think that this is a, a non-issue for most people over 60. Um, I was just involved with somebody right now. He's 75. He has a second wife and he has children. His youngest child from his first wife is 19 and he has two children that are five and seven. Okay, so he's, oh, he's a 75, so it's, I said most people. Okay, anyways, anyways, um, Ramosha Feinstein says that a lady is not allowed to induce labor because you're not allowed to put yourself into sakana. Having a baby is dangerous. So, a person is allowed to go al pider chateva. And der chateva, you go into labor and the whole system works, but to go run into the street, you're not allowed to do that unless 
there has to be obviously it has to be um, it has to be measured the amount of risk. Sometimes it becomes a greater risk to not induce labor than to induce labor. And this a specialist has to be asked. And I just being that we're discussing the medical community, I have no choice but with glee because this is my I think my third experience this week with the medical community, which um, is not as honest as they should be. My oldest daughter was overdue when she was born. She was overdue. I mean, my wife was overdue. I guess that's what said, really. And um, I went to the doctor and had her checked out. And the doctor said, it was on a Wednesday. And the doctor says, bring her in tomorrow. We're going to induce labor tomorrow. So I said, what's the problem? So he gave me the statistics. I don't remember exactly what they were at the time. And I said, um, I have to ask my rabbi. So he starts screaming at me. What do you mean? It's Kuach Nafesh, you know, you ever heard this, this scenario? So I said, okay. I said, very nice, but I'm going to go and ask my rabbi. So I went and asked my rabbi. And I'll just mention even uh, who it was it's a while ago. I asked Shmuel Kamenetsky. And he tells me, he listens to all the facts and figures. And he says, don't induce. Amir Tzashem, by much of Shabbos, you'll have a baby regular. So I go back to the doctor on Thursday. Thursday was Thanksgiving. Anybody want to buy my daughter a birthday present so now you know when her birthday is? Okay, her birthday was Thanksgiving. And I told the doctor, um, I'm sorry I can't uh, have her induced on Thursday because it's three days before Shabbos. But um, on Sunday or on Monday, she can be induced. So he says, so come in on Tuesday. So I said, why is that? I thought that, yeah, he said, yeah, but I'm off on Sunday, Monday. This is a weekend. Are you guys from America? You know what I'm talking about, right? Sakonis the Farshes, you have to do it right away on Thursday. But, you know, golf, that's like really important, right? So anyways, so um, the end was that uh, my daughter was born 90 minutes after Shkia Matzah Shabbos. So it's a question if you're Shmuel's, uh, by Matzah Shabbos, you'll have a baby. It was Emmis or not. It was on Matzah Shabbos, before Matzah Shabbos, I don't know, but whatever. But the bottom line is, there's danger. And then there's eminent danger. And there's a certain amount that you're allowed to put yourself into danger for. So Rabbi Yashiv says, a person is allowed to put himself into danger and eat the crane without worrying about taco. Why? Because it's not such, a, not such a dangerous danger. Not such a shchiach a danger. But the Torah is going to tell you to do it. If the Torah is commanding you to do it, you're not doing it voluntarily. The Torah is demanding you to do it then the Torah has to make sure that you do it in a way that's safe. So if you do it on your own accord, you have a right to put yourself into X amount of danger. But if the Torah is putting you into danger, the Torah has to cross its T's and dot its I's, and the Torah has to make sure that it's safe. And the Rush has a very similar idea to this. So this is already a fascinating idea. So sometimes you find that for the mitzvah, if the mitzvah demands a person be in danger, so then there's a histai gut from the mitzvah. The mitzvah already, now I'll just mention um, an issue. Klal Yisrael in the Midbar did not do bris milah. Why didn't they do bris milah? Because there's this ruach tzfainis. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just telling you what it says. There's a ruach tzfainis that makes it dangerous to do milah. Shevet Levi did do bris milah. What, there was no, in Machna Levia, there was no Ruach Tzvoinus? Of course there was. But there was no obligation, and this is exactly, we have this situation. You're potter, but you're allowed. Okay, that's basically what happened. Chashuv Lecha, you're allowed to do it. That's situation number one. Uh, you're asking me that question. Uh, no, no, no. I'm going to answer that question. Today, 100% I'll go to the rabbi. I don't trust doctors. 
I would just, I'm just uh, telling you right now, I don't have anything against doctors, but I don't trust them just like that. I'm going to tell you another story happened to me here in Ankarim 23 years ago. My son, Baruch Hashem, is married. Everything is fine. My son had metacarpal meningitis. And Sakonis uh, Nefoshis, my family, my family doctor, Mama saved his life. He forced us to go to the hospital. The hospital didn't want to accept us. A whole story. But the bottom line was they wanted to do some treatment that I didn't feel was the right treatment to do. And um, I did my research. You people know. I did my research. And I came up with another idea. And I spoke to a head of the department in Hadassah from a different department that had to do with the other treatment that I wanted to do. And he said, it sounds to me like a good idea. Speak to the head of the department. And if he's my sheret, I'm my sheret also. So I told the secretary, I want to speak to the doctor. So he said, when he comes around on rounds, you could speak to him. Fine, he comes around on rounds and he tells the students, there's you know, 50 students over there and he's telling them, uh, you know, what happened. And um, I say, excuse me, I asked you a question. So oh, this, I'm the father of this child. I want to ask you a question. It's the file current in your mind. You know what's going on? She says, yeah. So I said, I would like to suggest, instead of doing what you want to do, a different procedure. And he says, he turns to the students, he says, that's a procedure to do. Anybody who says that has no right to be called a doctor. So I said to him, you say you're current with the file. This suggestion is in the file by a head of a department in this hospital. This I said in front of 50 people. So I thought that I had him, right? He turns to the 50 students and he says, this is a classical example why there should be no discussion between doctors and patients, only between doctors. So he trained 50 people to be what? Incompetent rights him, right? I had this week, I had, I had, I was in, I was in, with a head of a department in Ankaram this week. I had, you know, now there are one many wonderful doctors also, but you want to know. If I trust the doctors, I trust the Gemara. The Gemara says, That's what the Gemara says. And I don't need Rashi and Toysvis to explain that to me because I've, I've seen it. But the truth of the matter is that I speak to doctors all the time, and there are many wonderful doctors, competent, ehrlich, unassuming. And when a doctor tells me something, I check it out. I ask a second opinion as I do in many areas. So sometimes you don't have a choice, you don't have the luxury of time. And sometimes you do. So I can't answer that question today. Maybe I'm a little bit more savvy in the field than I was at that time. But if they would tell me that you have to do it, otherwise, otherwise your wife is gonna die. So you have no time to ask her questions. You do whatever you're doing, you're Miss Powell, that's all. But because a doctor says it, and this is no different, I'm just making this clear because I have experience with doctors. Doctors guess as much as a cabbie guesses which way there's more traffic. No, 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 I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not joking. And there's no way they have no choice because each and every case is different. And I'll tell you something else, and just this is an important piece of information. If you want to know my, my uh, Many times I have questions. Last week I had a medical question. I spoke to the doctor in America. I have an apartment in America to speak to him, what he had to say. And sometimes the doctor, the super doctor that I'm speaking to says one thing. And the local doctor, who's by far less experienced, says something else. And I'll say to listen to the local doctor. Why is that? Because he's there. He sees the patient. So there's also a decision which has to be made. And this is not my approach. This is everybody in the medical field is aware of that. The doctor that's there on the grounds, if he's chatsi competent, right? So you have to know. Doctors 
guess. And I know. I'll just tell you one more story because over 60 crowd, these things are important. I, I'm going to say this over. This is a, a wonderful piece of introduction to who I am personally. I, about 20 years ago, maybe 25 years already, on Tisha B'Av, B'arech, I contracted hepatitis. And I had a really horrible Tisha B'Av, and it was wrong with me. It took me about a week to figure out what was wrong with me, and I found out that I had hepatitis, and it came before Yom Kippur, and I wasn't sure if I should fast or not. I wasn't sure. So I spoke to my doctor, and my doctor says, I don't know. So I started asking around professionals. And I got varied answers. And it was very frustrating. I, I wouldn't, if they told me to eat on your kippah, I would have eaten on your kippah. If they told me to fast on your kippah, I fast on your kippah. But I can't even ask a shala to row because they're going to say, what's the doctor say? And I cannot get a consensus from the doctors what I should be doing. So I went to a world famous doctor and I asked him, what's going on? And he laughed at me. He said, what do you think what's going on? Nobody knows. There is no medical testing done to see about people who had hepatitis when they fast. People don't fast. So where do the doctors get their opinions from? Their experiences. So they have varied experiences, and then we get varied answers. So he told me, so I said, so I him, what do you think? He says, do whatever you want. Whatever you do is okay. Whatever you do, there's somebody that's going to say, you're doing the wrong thing. Do whatever you want. So what did I do? What do you think I did? You think I went to shul? Oh, it is as follows. Before, well before Yom Kippur, I super hydrated myself with all these like insured drinks, you know, you know, these, uh, these, uh, I don't know what they're called, like supplemental, you know, whatever. And I got, you know, beefed myself up with those. And I took a bed in the yeshiva that you could hear the davening from the bedroom. And I slept a whole Yom Kippur, and I only got up and Davin Shemona Eser. Basically, that's what I did. And uh, nothing happened to me. I did not overextend myself. If I, would, if I would have been at home, I probably would have been rummaging around more than I was in that environment. There's nothing to do. You know, you just have no, just all you do is I, did was I slept and I Davin a little, and that was it. And I was absolutely fine. Now, did I do the right thing or the wrong thing? I don't know. I don't know. But I know that I didn't overexert myself. I remember at that time, I was thinking to myself, why did Kesh Baruch do this to me? You know, like, and the answer is today, I tell people, don't go to Shul and Davin and Yom Kippur. I have no compunctions about doing it. Because I did it. I did what I could, and that's all. And I'm going to do more. So anyways, you ask me, what would I do nowadays? Um, I'm a scarred soldier, you understand? So maybe if the send me to shrink, I'm not really sure. But, um, but uh, the, the truth is there are many wonderful doctors and um, they should be trusted to a certain degree. And that's, that's the end of that. that. And I always want to tell you something. A doctor, listen carefully. I'm just telling this to, because again, over 60 people, people would know. I was by a halachic medical conference. And the question was asked, this was in B'nai Brak, the question was asked, you have a lady who has a baby that's breech. And the doctor says, if she's going to fast on Yom Kippur, then fasting causes um, contractions. She'll probably go into labor and they're going to make a cesarean. If you let her eat, she'll be able to have a vaginal delivery. What is Allah in such a case? Let the lady eat or have the lady fast and she may have to go into 
that you may go into labor and you'll have to have a C-section. Okay? Now, I don't think any of you guys are doctors that you have any, you know, way to answer this question. But I'm going to share with you somebody at this thing made the following statement. It is medically, statistically proven cesareans are less of a sakana for the lady. Better have a cesarean always than a regular delivery. And all I could do was smile. I said, this guy must work for the, uh, the office of, that insures doctors, malpractice. Why is that? Because a vaginal delivery, the doctor's not in charge and all kinds of things can go wrong. And it's really dangerous. Whereas a C-section, he's in control. Much less can go wrong. It's much safer. The only thing is that there's a shmata on the table. The lady is chatzid uh, over after that operation, right? It's not, you know, and what it does to her body. What it, but as far as the technical aspect of delivering the baby, it's optimal. And the doctor who may be sued for malpractice, he pushes it because it's better for him. Statistically, he's doing better. Alan, what do you say? Financially as well. Yes, that's also. I was going to mention that. Okay, but this is I started to teach you the ABCs of. Uh, so, but 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 again, the truth of the matter is that there are many wonderful doctors. You know, you know but. You ask me a question. Uh, I don't trust the cabbie either. <laughs> it's not, it's not, you know, the, the cabbie says it's the best way to go. You know, maybe the best way to go. So you put the mona on, you don't put the mona on. You know, this is the same game happens anyway. Anyways, let's continue on to the, uh, on this area. So here we have, we have a, another subject which I'd like to mention. So here we have, when the terror is not going to demand of you to do something, if there's danger. I'm going to tell you two psukim of modern day Paiskim, and then I want to speak about Corona in general. Shalom Zaman Orbach Paskim as follows. A person has to have, let's say, a valve transplant in his heart or a pacemaker put in, or, you know, one of these mundane, everyday heart procedures. Okay? We all understand that that person is a Chayla Shiesh Paisakana. Right? That, that, that's understood. How quickly does he have to have it done? It's not an emergency. What's the window of time? Maybe two months, six months. Right? They set you up. They, there's not, it's, it's not an emergency situation. Right? This, uh, I don't know if people are aware of this uh, many times, at least. Okay? So the person is slated. He's penciled in in the hospital. Now we are in September. We're giving you, we have a November. We have a slot for you. Okay? They call him up this Friday. And they say, we had somebody who's supposed to have an operation this Shabbos, and he died. We have an extra slot for you this Shabbos. Do you want to take it now or not? It's us, sir, to do an operation on Shabbos. Unless it's Pekuach Nefesh. We just penciled in November. Is he allowed to make that operation on Shabbos? Shlomo Zalman says he's allowed to. Why is that? Shlomo Zalman says, um, and now, again, after I says what he says, I'm going to comment about whether that's applicable today. He said, we live in a country that is always on the verge of war. And when there's war, when there's corona, when there's something going on, you can't get an operating theater. So who's to guarantee that he'll be able to do it on the penciled-in date? He's a chayla shiyesh by sakana. You have an opportunity to do it now. You could do it now and be mechal Shabbos. 
that's a, a, a fantastic suck, right? That's against what most people would have thought. But what's it based on? He is a Chodesh Yesh Sakana. And what did we say last week? Could somebody guarantee he'll have an operating theater in November? No. So Shalom Zalman says you can do it. Now, I'm not saying right now discussing whether this is true today. No, it's, even if I agree with him, I'm, no, it's, I'm not discussing, you know, this has to be um, measured every time that the situation arises to know when is that true, when is it not true. That's, that's, but that's, Nikuda number one. Says the Chazanish. If Klal Yisrael, if the land of Israel is at war, a munitions factory may be opened on Shabbos to produce bullets, I don't know, grenades, I don't know, whatever, whatever, whatever it is that they produce. Why? It's a of We don't know. You don't have a war escalate. We, we don't know. He said, but if you're on the threshold of war, even though it's imminent, it's forbidden. There is no pekuach nefesh situation. In my opinion, these two psakim are not a stira at all. One, you have the pekuach nefesh, and yes, you statistically could take care of it. And the case of the chazanish, something may happen that it will become a pekuach nefesh. But that pekuach nefesh situation isn't here lefanecha. And on what basis is this discussed? The Chazanish's discussion is about harvesting organs to make transplants when you don't have the choyle here lefanecha. So this is very common. They take them nowadays, they freeze them, and then they use them somewhere else. So for Kuach Nefesh, you're allowed to harvest an organ. Are you allowed to harvest an organ if you don't have the Chayla Lefanecha? So this is not the subject of our, of our shir, but this is, this is relevant to uh, very, very the Allah Chalamai said. It's not, uh, this is not a... Uh, now, um, I'm going to make this clear. Uh, when I came to Ramat Beit Shemesh, I'm not sure how many years ago. How many years ago, Ari? About 17, 15 to 20 years. 17 years ago. Okay, 17 years ago, Ramat Beit Shemesh wasn't so built up as it was today. And the infrastructure wasn't there. And Hatzala was still also a fledgling organization. And became the question about coming back from a call. What's the possibility that you're going to be called again? And these are things which Kedalia Paiskim have to decide. Are we in the situation that you always have to get back to base or not? And this, I spent some time at that time uh, investigating that halachic aspect, which again, is something that evolves and changes. We say that we do not go bust a roiv from Kuach Nefesh. That's true. But that's only, says the Aruch Lener, that's only when you have the Roiv and the Miyat Lefanecha. If it's only what's called the Ruba de Lessa Kamon, then you go after the statistic. And therefore, he says this question which we asked last week, why is it permissible to go on to a sea craft, to Zvulun, to go to... to, go to uh, catch fish, I don't know, whatever he did, or whatever, do fish, or he did commerce in other places. So because we know there's no raging storm out now, and it's only a statistical chance that something may happen, and the odds are in your favor. In that situation, you're allowed to do it. When there's, not, when there's no vadai sakana lefanecha, and it's only a statistical chance, if it's not the roiv, a person is allowed to. That's a quotient that has to be examined every time. Step, the next step. I was asked the following question. We're moving out of the medical field. We're going to Ribis, and then I'm going to come back to the medical question. Got a phone call from somebody. There is a uh, online company that they are shatchanim. 
there are, there are people that need to borrow money and people want to lend money. And the people that want to borrow money cannot get a bank loan. So these loans are at a higher premium. But they have, for some reason, they can't get a bank loan, but they have other reasons to be assumed that they're a good investment. So this company sets up the Malva and the Lova together. Okay, he sets them up and let's say all the Malvas are odd and all the Loivas are even and they set them up. You have no idea who the person that you're doing. It is just a number. And obviously there are credentials that are used to decide how good an investment it is or not. And that depends on what the, insur- what the, what the interest rate which you will receive. So a person called me up and said, am I allowed to do this or not? Maybe the guy I'm going to lend my money to is a Jew. So I asked him, does this company take any responsibility? He says, zero. All they do is get a finder's fee. So it's, your, it's your personal vote to that person. They do some management aspect, but they, nothing. So uh, became a fascinating Allah question. Is this a roi? Is it a kavua? You know, what, what, what is, for some reason, I couldn't find any place in the Rishayim that spoke about this, <laughs> right? You know, this was not, not around. So I said, there's a chuba for Rabbi Yashiv which discusses this issue. And it's a fascinating chuba in Hilchus Yuchsin, but the, the, the bottom line is that he says when you have what's called, in order to have a Roy, we have to have Kavua, which means that you know for sure there's something else over here. You're not sure if this person is the usher person or not. Do you have to know for a fact that there's somebody there? In other words, in other words, a person goes, um, to a market and he wants to buy fruit and he doesn't know if they took chumas or mysis or not. He knows that most of the people take chumas or mysis, but he's not sure in this store, do they take chumas or mysis or not? This is not, I'm not making a halachic statement. I'm just using it as a muscle. So if you know that right people take chumas or mysis, so it could be, you can go bus or right. But if you're going to take it, so then the halacha is, it has a bit of a kavua, and even if there's one person that doesn't take chumas or mysis, you're not allowed to take it. Says Rabbi Yashiv, when is that true? That's when I know that there is one person that didn't, one stall that they didn't take chumas or mysis. But I'm just assuming that there's somebody in the Tumas Maestras, then there's a machlaikis achreinim if you, if you, if you go buster, if you, if you, if, if you have to be choshish for the, for the miut as a kavua. And he has his, his computation of how and when we decide this. I'm going into the shul. Corona's dangerous. We're not, we're not discussing that right now. Corona's dangerous. Do I know that there's somebody in the shul that has corona? No. So therefore, am I allowed to go basaroid? Could very well be. This is totally on the answer to the question which we just gave. Now, even if, just want to make it clear, Rabbi Yashiv's answer has to do with how mistaver it is, and he explains how we come to that conclusion. Now, even if, there's somebody in there that has corona, doesn't mean that I'm going to catch it. Right? In other words, you're right next to an electri- live electric line. Doesn't, you're not going to get electrocuted. If you don't touch it, it doesn't happen, right? So if he's wearing his mask, you're wearing your mask. Even if there was somebody with corona there, so the shash is very small. Can I guarantee that someone's not going to get Corona in that situation? Would you say that a person who goes is crazy? Hard to say he's crazy. There's proper ventilation. No, no, it's so culture came if we don't know that a person has corona. How mistaver is it? And these are part of the, I'm just gonna end up over here. These are part of this subject which has to be discussed when we're discussing. You know, are you allowed or not allowed? Or what is the chash? What is not the chash? Now, as long as we don't know 
what the numbers are out there. It's very hard to answer the question. But we also know, we also know, and this, in my opinion, is true, la halacha, it depends on your matzav um, reka. That's how they say it. You know, uh, the, your, your, your medical profile and how much chance you're allowed to take. So somebody who's sound physically is allowed to take a greater chance. Somebody who has compromised medical health, so he is not allowed to take so much of a chance. So somebody asks me, in Corona, are you allowed to go to Shul to Davin? So I don't know. There's a question, and I believe that there's a way to come to a clear answer. But there are many people, and I believe most people, will fall into the category of it depends how and what you look at things. Now, I just want to make a statement. That we, I'm finished. This year is finished. I just want to make a statement. Um, today, I was speaking to somebody about Yom Naroim. And I'm going to share with you an observation, which I knew was true, but now I have it uh, you know, documented. The subject was people davening in outdoor minyanim. I, this, this is right now, I'm not right now speaking hashkafa about what we spoke about on Shabbos. It's not, I'm not discussing that at all. And the general consensus, at least which I heard at this, uh, that this person came to the following conclusion. People, though they feel that it's dangerous to daven in shul, and this is not my opinion, I'm telling you, there are those who daven in outside Minyanim because they feel dangerous, at least for them, to daven in Shul. On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, rather daven in Shul where it's air conditioned than sweat outside. So I said to the person, I agree that that's what most people would probably do and say or think. But I just want to share with you my feeling on this issue. You are willing to put yourself in danger in order to be comfortable. In other words, you say going to shul is dangerous, but being outside is uncomfortable. So you rather dive in, in shul and be comfortable and not dive in outside and be safe. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm just, okay, so you want to, uh, I don't know how long the outdoor menu is, but let's, for argument's sake, it's four hours. Yeah. That's a long time to have to run outside. Four hours. Now, two things I'd like to say, that could be, but if you feel that going to shul is dangerous, stay home. But no, 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 the, the kud over here is, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not speaking about anybody in particular. This is, you know, this is not a personal issue. But what this just, what this highlights, and this is the reason why I'm saying it, that there's everybody is weighing the pluses against the minuses, and everybody is saying, oh, that word everybody's also, a, a, you know, but the majority of people, it's just a question of what our um, Say that the what are what are you know what I said I said oh I said in English or, yeah so that's that's that that is I'm just saying but a person has to realize and what's really important a person has to be intellectually honest with himself and to know what you're doing why you're doing it that's all and a person decides that I, it's more it's important enough for me that I want to go to school. Could be a lot to do it. If this person says, I don't feel comfortable going to shore and I want to dive out to me, could be should do that. Could you want to stay at home? No, I'm not right now. This is not a, this is not a, this is not right now a halachic issue. I'm just telling you that there is a place where the person's emotional state of mind, besides the aspect of how much kavani will have, but the way that he faces the stress of the unknown, that will tell us whether he's allowed to put himself into that dangerous situation or not. So I just, you know, I think that at least from 
all the things that we spoke about, I think that we have at least a little bit of a better idea of what the subjects are, and at least people themselves, when they have a question, if they want to ask a question, even to themselves, we should have at least a clearer understanding of what, in, what is entailed in this question. But the bottom line is that it's also to, for a person to put himself into Vada Sakana. If it's a suffix Sakana, it depends how big of a Sakana, and it makes a difference if it's a miut of Vada Sakana or a miyut of something which may become a sakon. So there are all the different halachic variables that have to be factored in in order for the person to come to the conclusion to know what is mutter, what is aser, and sometimes the question is, what is the rots of a Kodesh Bochum? Okay, I don't think we're going to meet next week. We'll see what happens in the, in the interim. Okay. Okay, good night.